Jesus, we ask your blessing upon the Word of God this morning. We ask your blessing, Lord, that it might go down into our hearts and give us strength, that we might, through it, Lord, have confidence, through just hearing about it, Lord, that we would have peace. We ask, Jesus, that your Spirit would fill us with your Word from the inside and the outside. We thank you, Lord, for watching over us. Guide us, lead us, show us, teach us. We surrender. Amen. Amen. Well, this message is going to be an interesting one because it's at that much, and i got to get through the whole thing. So, taking a deep breath before the Lord, <laughs> buckling up our seat belts, <laughs> we'll see how fast we can fly. So if I go too quick, just drink it. Just drink it. Doesn't mean you have to have to uh, get all the verses down, but you probably should. But you'll notice that most of the verses that I'm using are very easily grouped together based on keywords, because I was going after a particular boom, 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 boom little heartbeat. And uh, so you you could go look up your own verses based on knowing what I'm going after. But I am going to try and go through them. I've actually got a whole bunch more in here than probably I need. But at the same time, it produces an effect. An effect of, wow, there's a whole lot of this. And the wow, there's a whole lot of this is a real important point to this message. The title of this message is, By Every Word. By Every Word. Matthew 4.4 4 says, He answered and said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I was talking to a brother this week. We were in the middle of a conversation. And I uh, don't remember the conversation exactly. But I remember at one point this punch of spiritual air hit me. Whew. As I said the phrase, by every word that proceeds, we are supposed to be living by every word. And the phrase, by every word, just went, woof. And I looked at the brother and I said, hmm, sounds like Sunday's message coming. <laughs> by every word. Do we ever even stop to really, really feel that? By every word. By every word. This isn't deep theology. This is baby basic theology. And yet it is um, going to take a mature saint to grab it all. We are supposed to be living, 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 living. We are supposed to be living by every word of God. And, of course, we have heard all kinds of verses, and some of them will come across today, you know, that define and say, yep, you're supposed to be living by every word. But do we feel that? Does it get down in our stomach? Does it come up from somewhere down inside in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of a tough time, in the middle of a difficult scenario? Does it come down to, ooh, got to live by the word? What's the word? Where's the word? Seek and you shall find the word. Where's the word? What's the word? No, I think probably we do more of a ask God and hope and, you know, Roll a prayer up in the air and see if it lands somewhere. The truth of the matter is, that's all well and good, but there's the word. Jesus' answer is very precise out of every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I started thinking, okay, the word, the word. What's the word? And we know what the word is. This is simple. This isn't deep, is it? And I thought, or is it? Why is it that we need to have the revelation of we're living by every word? By every word. It says in Hebrews 4.12, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word is quick, powerful, and sharp. Touche. <laughs> it's like, 
here we are trying to bludgeon our way through life and God's given us a weapon that's quick and sharp and powerful. He's given us a scalpel that can go right down and divide thoughts and intents. Well, is this my heart, or is this the heart of God, or is this the heart of my friends, or is this the heart of my co-workers? This is the heart. Just slice it right down. Well, let's put it to the test of the Word of God. What's the Word of God? Oh, the Bible. Uh, let's pause on that for a moment and say, not quite, but quite. The Word of God, sharper, more powerful, capable, strong. It's not wimpy, weak, philosophical man thinking. It's not the enticing words of men's wisdom thinking, which must be bludgeoning <laughs> thinking. Romans 10.17 says, So then, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Yeah, yeah, I know, hearing by the word of God. No, wait a second, hearing by the word of God. The word of God comes and then you hear. Or is it that you hear and then the word of God comes? Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. So your faith is sitting here, non-existent or partly existent or mildly existent, and along comes the word. Saddles up next to you, sits down on the bench, you know. Hey, how you doing? Uh, hmm, here's my opinion. And you go from unbelief to faith in a single jump. Through the word. The word. Second Corinthians two seventeen, for we are not as we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God we speak in Christ. We don't corrupt the word. The word is not to be touched. It's not to be messed with. It's not to be played with. It's sharp. It's dangerous. I mean, imagine t having your little child go into the knife drawer and pull out your sharpest cutting knife, and play with it. This is a very powerful weapon. Powerful tool. It is something not to be tinked with. It shouldn't be corrupted. We shouldn't be playing with it. We shouldn't try to be bending it to our will. We shouldn't be trying to, let's see if we can theologically re-abstract that in order to make it fit our preconceived notions. It should be respected. It should be untouched. It should be uncorrupted. We should speak it directly. Second Corinthians 4.2 uses the phrase, not nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Mm -hmm. Don't use it wrongly. Think about this for a moment. A being. Name, God. Well, title, God. Says something. And we come along and use it to our advantage. Have you ever had somebody take the word you spoke and quote it out of context in such a way that it made you look like you believe something you didn't believe? Have you ever seen somebody in, like, in a racial argument or something like that take a phrase and pull it out and just because it has a word or two in it that they don't like, turn it and use it as a assault when it wasn't even in your mind to think that? Ever had somebody quote you on something that you said years ago to use it as a weapon against you? You know, it says the Pharisees and Sadducees tried to trap Jesus in his words. They tried to take his word and they tried to handle it deceitfully. They tried to twist it. Well, you said you was going to destroy the temple. Uh, but he spake of the temple of his body. Weren't you listening? <laughs> Second Corinthians 6, 7 uses the phrase, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and the left. By the word of truth. Everything God speaks is truth. We are supposed to be living by every truth. We're not supposed to be living in unreality. We're not supposed to be living in our imaginations of our heart, as the scripture says. We're not supposed to be living by our natural mind. We're not supposed to be living by our carnal reasoning. We're supposed to be living by the word of truth. Give me the truth. You can't handle the truth. Well, I better handle the truth. <laughs> I better not run from it. 
I better allow it to come down and look into the little corridors of my soul and open a few doors here and there and take a peek and say, Hello, <laughs> what's in here? Can I fix this? The word of truth, the word of the true one. Ephesians 6.17, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It's the sword of the Spirit. Now, the Spirit is an invisible, omniscient, everywhere present, really smart being. <laughs> so he could sit up here for eternity and do nothing. Because he can do that. Or he could choose to speak his word. Now, what happens when an all-powerful, all-knowing, and omniscient, and such a being speaks a word? Lots. Instant action. Instant inter... inter um, um, not intervention. Uh, interjection. Instant, why are you intruding in my life? Stuff. When God speaks, it's a sword. Book of Revelation uses a picture and says a sword came out of his mouth. I think that statement and this statement belong together in the interpretation passages. <laughs> That's what you meant. Oh, out of your mouth comes the word of God. Sharp, divisive. Cutting and dividing. Separating and piercing. Puncturing. We don't toy with the truth. The truth can kill. The truth can give life. When we decide to speak the word of God, we've got to realize we're delivering daggers. So if somebody goes, ouch, don't be surprised. If somebody speaks the truth to you and all of a sudden your heart goes, Ugh, don't be surprised. Master surgeon on assignment. It is hard. It's very hard to have a being who can come at you and just get right through all your defenses, all of your pretenses, all of your suspicions, all of your doubts, and go, <clears throat> Hi, it's me. Just thought I'd do a little one-on-one. -on -one. Colossians 1.25, Where am I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God? Colossians 1.25, To fulfill the word of God. The word of God has plans in it. The Word of God has things that have to be carried out in it. The Word of God has commands in it. The Word of God has explanations in it. Our job as ministers, as saints, as those who follow after the Word, make sure that it comes to pass. Make sure it comes alive in us. Some of it is going to come live in us because prophecy will come live in us. Some of it is going to come live in us because we're going to decide to make it come live in us. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you have received, when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. I keep getting hit up by people asking me the question, how do you know that this Bible is written is from God. How do you know? It's not just the words of men. Well, let me read that for you again. You received the word of God, which you heard from us, received it not as the word of men. Isn't that a Bible authenticity verse? But as it is in truth, the word of God. I'm telling you, I even know it's not me. So both the author says it's not him and the receivers who listen to the author said it wasn't him. And that is one of your cornerstone pieces for knowing that we are reading the Word of God. Which effectually worketh also in you that believe, and there's your last piece, the Word of God always has an effect. It always worketh in you. Always works you over, really, is what it does. 1 Timothy 4, 5. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The word of God can separate. The word of God can set things aside. The word of God can make distinction. 2 Timothy 2, 9. 
wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not found. They can lock up the saint. They can capture the minister. They can put us in a corner in a box. But the word of God will not be bound by that. If we are living epistles, they can put us in a vault, but they can't stop the message. In fact, if they put us in a vault, they're likely to encourage the message. Because <laughs> sooner or later, one of two things is going to happen. Either God's going to take us out of the vault, mm -hmm. and he always brings things out of the vault with new. Ask John, who got stuck on Patmos for a while. Mm -hmm. Ask Luther, who got put up in a castle for a while. Ask any man of God that's ever been cornered for a while what happens while they're in the cornered state. A little endurance, a little pain, yes, but when they come out, the testimony ten times stronger. Yeah. The followership is a hundred times greater. And even the death of a saint, the unexpected death of a saint, which there have been several of in the last ten years, all of a sudden the word of God is preached. Right? When those who preach the word of God are unexplicably taken from us and preached right up to the last minute of their very existence, like Linda Knight and her husband did, the word of God is not bound. It becomes infinitely movable. The issue here is, what are we? We're ungaloi. We're messengers. We carry the flame. We're Olympians running across the landscape. <laughs> We're doing our own special Olympics. <laughs> We're carrying the torch. Knock us down, flame goes on. We hand it off. It just keeps going. The word of God will not be bound. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Pay attention to what God says and get him right. How about that for an interpretation? Would you like to be misunderstood? Would you like somebody always misunderstanding your words? <laughs> always redefining what you have to say? Of course not. Neither does God. He does not like to be uncorrectly quoted. He doesn't like to be incorrectly explained. He is going to care how you represent him, what you say about him. He is going to care how it affects time streams. He's going to care what it does to the people who imbibe it. We're not just in the business of making doctrines. We're not in the business of scholastically turning out a bunch of stuff to consider. We're supposed to be turning out only one thing. The clarion call of the word. And if we have to dig a little, pray a little, seek a little, call a little, summon a little, grab a little, grasp a little, knock a little, etc. Till we get it all, then that's what we got to do. Every day, in every way, more of God. Every day, in every way, saying to God, what did you mean by this verse? I do not want to teach this verse wrongly. I don't want to misunderstand you. Please explain it to me. I'll go to your men and women of God and I'll check and see what you've told them. But you've got to tell me too. And you've got to get confirmation. Hebrews 13.7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Some would say, Remember them that have the rule over you, and just do as you're told. <laughs> a la Catholicism. No, what it says is, who have spoken unto you the word of God. They better be speaking the word of God. And it says, whose faith follow, not whose opinion follow. Considering the end of their conversation. Taking a look to see if it produces anything. The Word of God is a seed that gets planted and grows into a big bush. The Word of God is lightning that strikes from the sky. The Word of God is rain that falls on the ground. The Word of God is life. Something will happen every time it shows up. 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God. Imagine that. 
Somebody did yakety yakety yak from a book that was really black. You looked at the world and turned your back. Yakety yakety yak. And the message goes on and on and on. And the Word of God goes out of one person into another person they turn around and it comes out of that person into another person. It turns around from there. It goes out of that person into another person. Do you understand what I'm saying here? The Word of God. Think of it like this. Think of it like somebody came up with an a, uh, injection. Came up with an injection. And they're running around with this injector. <laughs> and they walk up to a person and go, Did you know that you're sick? And the person all crept over and goes, No. <laughs> Would you like to be better? Uh, okay. Here, let me inject this in you. Squish. And all of a sudden the person goes, Oh, that was warm. Oh, what was that? And change takes place. I was talking yesterday to somebody and I said, You know, you've got to understand. When you're on the world side of the gospel looking at the fence over at the gospel, you can see a certain amount of the gospel, but you can't see it all. And you can't see all the world either. You get on the other side of the fence and quit being in the middle of the fence and look back over the fence from this side of the gospel and you see not only the world clearer, you see the gospel clearer. Right because you're now in it. The perspective changes. You're not down in the valley anymore. You're up here on the mountain and you now have perspective. Right. Whereas before you were down in the valley. The Word of God comes out of us <laughs> and it makes us born again. But you know, we've got to take it a step further. When God speaks... He must have a plan then that says, I speak and I put my power behind it. If you accept my words, you get me. 1 John 2, 5. 1 John 2, 5. Whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Perfected. The word of God grows in us until we are perfected by it. So then what happens? Eventually we become the Word of God, don't we? So then they look at us. You know, some people say the only Jesus they'll ever see is you. Well, you know, what's interesting about that is whatever truth they're going to see is you too. Mm -hmm. As you go about. They know who you are. They know who you are by what you are. And as much of the Word as you absorb, the more you will show. The Word is like perfume. Perfume. You put it on and everybody notices you when you walk in the room. <laughs> Some people can't stand the smell of God's perfume. <laughs> they need an olfactory adjustment on a spiritual plane. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They need to be able to accept it. Skip to verse. Hebrews 6.5 have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Have tasted it. Have partaken of it. Have imbibed it. Have taken it in. But I actually like the use of the word taste in that, in that English sentence. Tasted it. Do you know that different truths have different tastes? Different truths have different nutrition? Nutritional, spiritual value? You know, there's some truths that will protect you from the devil. There's some truths that will bring you closer to God. There's some truths that will just separate you from all your problems. First John 2.14 I've written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. We would like to say, oh, I want to overcome the wicked one. I want to overcome the wicked one. But I'm not so sure about that abide in the word stuff. Saturation. You know what happens to a sponge when it gets saturated? It becomes squishable. Do you know what a sponge is like when it's not saturated? Thunk, thunk. Hard as a rock. You decide what kind of saint you want to be. Be a word of God saint. Soaked. <clears throat> Start marinating thyself. <laughs> Revelation 1-2 says, Who bear record of the word of God. Bear record of the word of God. We're in the business of bearing record. We are the witnesses. We're the probably the 1,439,259 6,199th, I don't know, 
Witness. <laughs> Witness. If we could see who saved us and then look at who saved them and then see who saved them and see who they saved them and then trace that back to who saved them and then trace that back to where the Word of God originally originated from, it would be an interesting lineage. We are ones who bear record. What happens if we don't bear record? We stop the Word of God. At least to the degree it's supposed to come out of us. Revelation 1.9 I, John, your brother, companion in tribulation, kingdom, patience, on the island, Patmos, etc. He was there for one reason. It says, for the word of God. I'm stuck on this rotten rock, eating rotten food, doing rotten things with rotten people who are criminals, and I've been branded a criminal so that, and because of that, the word of God. Kind of gets you the picture we're not as important as the Word of God. The Word of God must mo 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 <laughs> move on. The Word of God must go. Revelation 6 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the Word of God. We're going to die for this Word. Some of us. We're going to live for this word, all of us. Revelation 20, verse 4. I saw thrones, them that sat upon it, judgment was given, saw the souls of them that were beheaded, beheaded, for the witness of Christ and the word of God. You know, I never really could feel or see that phrase. I went right by it. I blew right by it. Yeah, they were beheaded for the witness of Christ, beheaded for the witness of Christ. In the news lately, how many times have you heard the statement, they've been beheaded? Ambassador so-and-so, been beheaded. Oh, it looks to me like a scripture starting to come back in play. It's been a long time since we've seen beheadings. It's increasing again. It's increasing again. The word of God will not be wrong. He didn't say... Yeah, the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Christ. But really what happened was they all got bombed by nuclear bombs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If we wrapped them all up in cattle cars and poisoned them. No, it says they were beheaded. Why? Because it's a public display, so everybody goes, ah. Ask yourself if you're willing to put your neck on the line for the word of God. Titus 1.3 but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Manifested his word through preaching. This is an important point, because as we go now into the other verses that I'm going to go after, which goes backward in time into the Old Testament, you'll realize that the word of God was not preached in the Old Testament. <clears throat> The passing on of the Word of God now is different than it was back then. We have a church with Christ as a head. When the mouth speaks, the body speaks. But before, the Word of the Lord was a one-on-one, -on -one, personal, and not everybody got it thing. Let's take a look at some of the passages that use the phrase "Word of God." I just took you through all the passages that I uh, uh, had on "Word of God," but now I'm going to. I'm sorry. Now I'm going to take you through the passages that use the phrase, and the word came. This phrase is significant. I think about this a lot when I talk to people. How do you know this Bible is is the Bible of God? How do you know it's the Word of God? Well, it's very simple, because the dudes that got it said, "Here's what happened." Genesis 15.1 After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Hmm. The word of the Lord came. Nowadays it's like, Whoa, the word of the Lord came. Uh, let me tell it to you from Abraham's point of view. Whoa! What was that? It's me. Oh, you. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Down to the ground, prostrate, flat on your face, and I'm listening. 
with my head cocked sideways. <laughs> now, how do we hear the Word of God today? <gasps> Word of God came. Well, that was a good message. <laughs> yeah, the Word's preached. Genesis 15:4 Behold the word of the <laughs> The word of the Lord came unto him saying This shall not be thine heir he shall he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir And the word of the Lord came and said by the way you know the future you don't know nothing about I just thought I'd tell you about it The word of the Lord came How did he know it was the word of the Lord Oh I don't know the kid arrived You know what I'm saying God always, when he speaks his word, has the fulfillment on the other side. Funny thing about the word, as we go through the rest of these passages, you're going to realize that when the word of the Lord comes, there's whole consequences here. Kids are born. Nations rise. Nations fall. Things happen. Not only to the one to whom it came, but to the ones who listened to the one to whom it came. And after a while, people start getting the idea, uh, that wasn't the man talking anymore. How do you know it was the God? How do you know it was the God? Uh, face to face, hit the ground, came to pass exactly as he said. I'd call that sound doctrine. Numbers 22, 20. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men call to thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. The word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. Well, I don't know, was Balaam a prophet of God or not? Was Balaam in God or not? I don't know if God comes down and says to a human being, <clears throat> it's me and do exactly as I tell you. And nobody else on the planet seems to be getting it, except maybe a few guys. I'd call them seer and listener if I were you. My point here is, Balaam woke up at the middle of night. <laughs> Oh, you're laying there nice on your cushy little, you know, silk pillow. And <clears throat> I have to admit, there's been times I've had this strange phenomenon. I don't know if you've ever had this happen. Have you ever had that happen where, where you swear somebody calls you from another room? Yeah. You go to that room, there's nobody there. Have you ever been laying in bed and, and you're, you're kind of like this and all of a sudden you hear your name called and you wake up and go, Yes, only there's a nobody talking. I've had it a few too many times. I know, it's auditory hallucinationing. I don't know, let's ask it what it wants and see if it's going to keep talking. <laughs> I had to realize that one day. Maybe I should have been listening. I probably missed a few of my understandings, revelations, insights, and deliverances because I went, oh, nobody here, I'm going back to bed. I think I better tune the ear a little bit. It does say he knows the saints by name, right? That means he could call us by name, right? I mean, he could actually pick up the spiritual telly and say, ringy, 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 I'd like to speak to you, please. One-on-one, -on -one personal, face-to-face, -face confrontation, discussion, and otherwise, please. You know what I'm saying? What I'm trying to say is, maybe we should tune our ears. Maybe we should tune up the dial on our uh, message machine. Maybe we should eh, eh, put it up there. Maybe we should quit trying to be so carnal. If Balaam can hear from the Lord. Well, anyway, you got my point. Mm -hmm. First Samuel 4, 1 Samuel 4.1. 1 Samuel 4.1. The word of Samuel came to Israel. The word of Samuel? What's he got to do with it? Okay, 1 Samuel 15.10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, <laughs> Trickle down. How do we know it wasn't the word of Samuel? It's the book of Samuel. It says it's the book of Samuel. I'll tell you why we know it's not the book of Samuel, because it says right here, and the word of the Lord came unto Samuel, saying, 2 Samuel 7, 4, And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, another guy getting woken up in the middle of the night, <laughs> 2 Samuel 24, 11, For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer saying, Gad, who's Gad? How many messages have you ever heard about the prophet Gad? Egad. <laughs> That's all you know. First Kings six eleven, the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying. 
1 Kings 12.22 But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying. 1 Kings 13.1 Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. The word of the Lord excuse me, came to a man of God out of Judah. Man of God out of Judah. See, it doesn't always say prophet of God. Now we're man of God. Seer of God. Person of God. How about saint of God? It's, it doesn't matter. The word of God goes to the people of God. So as soon as you decide to tack on to your existence, I'm of God, he has the right to say, and I talk. <laughs> but he doesn't talk enough. Really? <laughs> really? How many times do we not turn on our spiritual gifting? How many times do we say, not today, Lord, I'm busy? How many times do we say, not now? <clears throat> I don't know, if you call the same friend 52 times and he turns you down 52 times in a row, does it get hard on the 53rd time to call? Yes. Why should our God be any different? Draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you. Isn't that what he says? Yes. Why do you think he says that? Because he drew nigh several hundred times to the nation of so-and-so and -so, several hundred times they were busy. The wedding feast, go get me people for the feast. Invite them. Sorry, got to do this. Sorry, I'm busy. Can I abstain? Not right now. I will have a full feast. Get me everybody else. The word of the Lord. 1 Kings 13.20 And it came to pass as they sat at the table. This is the old prophet and young prophet story in case you don't recognize it. That the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. Do -de do 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 I brought the man of God home. Ha ha. He was supposed to leave but I was able to convince him. Ha ha. Uh, <clears throat> you forgot to invite me to dinner. <laughs> I'm here now. I decided to have sup in the name of two prophets. Ooh. What happens when two or three are gathered together in his name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dinner's a possibility too. God can show up at dinner time, night time, day time, morning time. We've seen it. Tell me what time God doesn't show up. Please, what are his visiting hours? <laughs> 1 Kings 16.1, the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Basha, saying, yeah, wouldn't you just love that? God comes to you and says, by the way, I got a message. It's not for you. I wanted you to tell it to him and tell him a toast. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. I'm going to deliver a, you're going to get bombed by God message. <laughs> I'm going to get tossed in a dungeon and have myself up to here in mud. And God says, so, you're going to deliver the message or not? Why did Catherine Coleman have to say, two men were chosen before me? Why have we heard that too many times? Why is it that God has to even ask? Because uh, there's a thing called God-like will he gave us. <laughs> I gave you the power to think like me, reason like me, and decide like me. But I'm going to kick your fanny every time you don't. Uh, no. I'm going to give you about 150 tries, and then I'm going to walk away for a little while and let you just get really dry. Make you realize, there's something wrong, I don't understand, I'm just, my tummy hurts. Mm. Have you eaten? Yeah. Have you slept? Yeah. Where's the pain coming from? Oh, how about a crying of the spirit way down inside that says, I haven't heard from him in a long time and I love him very much. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Spiritual hunger is a good thing. Spiritual thirst is a good thing. But I also mean God up there, ready to supply. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, and just for the sake of your smile, the title of this message is By Every Word. <laughs> First Kings 16, 7. Also by the hand of the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, came the word of the Lord against Basha and against his house, and even, yada, 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 yada. Yeah, against your family, against your property, against, your, well, that's it, okay. That guy's done. 1 Kings 17.1 Elijah the Tishbite, who was one of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, hint, there shall not be dew nor rain these days, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, turn thee eastward, hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, 
And I've commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, etc. So, God says, judgment's coming. But by the way, there's a brook up here. It'll take care of your food. I'll make sure ravens get there. You're going to be fine if you're listening to the word of the Lord, if you're the vehicle of the word of the Lord. Why wouldn't God want to protect his own messengers? Does any king send his messengers out with a, without water and sustenance to make the trip? You see where I'm going? If you're abiding in the Word of God, the Word of God is your, your, your duty, your commission, your life, your existence. God has a vested interest that kept you fed. Clothed, watered, healthier. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and plus, 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 plus. Because you are carrying on that which is Him. Will He not surely take care of Himself? 1 Kings 17.8 The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, 1 Kings 18.1 And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying... I mean, they even wrote it down. Third year of, fifth year of, second year of. How do we know it's the word of God? Because they put calendar dates on it. They made sure it was recorded. They made sure that they told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And on top of that, it was usually spoken in front of a lot of witnesses. Man walks up, says, This day thou shalt be destroyed. And then the man's destroyed. And 150 people saw it. And the reply is going to be, That wasn't the word of the Lord? It was just the guy's opinion that he wrote down. So you've got to get the reality of this. It's, it's strong. The word of God's been resonating for a long time. Boom, 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 boom. It's resonating. All we're doing is tracking it. All we're doing is turning the radio dial to it. All we're doing is making sure we record it. That's all the men of God in the Old Testament ever did. 1 Kings 18, 31. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. 1 Kings 19, 9. He came thither unto a cave, lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he says to him, what you doing there? Yeah. Elijah, what you doing there? I mean, doesn't that just sound personal? <laughs> Hi, thought I'd drop in. Adam, where art thou? Hey, what's going on? Are you having a pity party again? <laughs> I fed you, didn't I? I watered you, didn't I? I shut off the rain from heaven on them like you asked me to, didn't I? Please, why, pity party? <laughs> First Kings 21.17 The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying... You get the idea this Elijah dude had conversations. Not one-time visitations every 92 years. First King, uh, Second Kings 15.12 This was the word of the Lord which he spake unto Jehu, saying... Thy son shall sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. Yes, when things come to pass, it proves it wasn't the loony ideas of a wacky nut nut religious dude. Get prophecy from God. Get clear prophecy from God. Yeah. See clear prophecy fulfilled from God. Write little book called See God's Prophecy Fulfilled. Footnote Word of God. Nothing's changed. Well, I don't have time to keep a spiritual journal. Ah, shut up. <laughs> I wonder what would have happened if Elijah hadn't written it down for us. Paul had forgotten. Elias had just said, ah, it's not that a big deal. Moses said, cool laws, not bad, but I don't think we need to think about them much. 6,000 years later, God would still be looking for a man to write it down. <laughs> Because he's got to get it out there. That's right. Second Kings 20, verse 4. Oh, my word. And it came to pass, before Isaiah was gone into the middle of the court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, So here and now you visit you on your way, walking, talking, leaving, down the calls, the calls, the halls, the corridors of the kings. I don't know if the Lord's ever going to talk to me as I'm going between my desk and the bathroom at Boeing, but if he ever does, I better stop and stand still. 
You know what I'm saying? If I'm ever going for my normal pity party walk, pity party walk, having a little trouble with the lip through, um, <laughs> and all of, a, all of a sudden I hear, hello, or some other said sort of thing, I think I better stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. First Chronicles 17.3, And it came to pass the same night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Second Chronicles 22.7, Oh, come on, why are you beating this drum so much? We got it, we got the point. The word of the Lord came to people, okay? Oh, how oh, would you get the point? David says to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the Lord my God. I had this great idea. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Sorry, can't do. I was going to build God a temple. I had a ministry all figured out. And it had been a good one. And God said, no, I want to pass it on to your son. See, you have this kind of relationship with me, and he's going to have that kind of relationship with me. So your ministry is going to be to make sure all those psalms are written so everybody knows who Messiah is. And his job is going to make a temple that lets the Shekinah come down and blops every to the, everybody to the ground. Is that fair? Perfectly. Does God tailor make his word to his people so that the shoe fits? You can't do my calling. I can't do your calling. We may be all on that conveyor belt heading this way towards God, but I guarantee you, my sandals have a different cut than yours do. I could lend you my sandals if you'd like. See if you can not trip on them for a while. And I could try to wear your sandals if you like. Not. <laughs> not. Uh-uh. No, I've been watching how some of you endure your trials. I would have flunked them. I already can see that. And I suspect if some of you and you, it, it had the opinions, you all, not just speaking to anybody in this room, but you all, if I'd have done everything that people told me I should do, <laughs> I don't think my shoes have worked. Jeremiah 1.1, 1, 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests, were an anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. Uh, this is a spiritual journal, folks. <laughs> Date, time, place, event, verification of historical accuracy. It came also in the days of Jeho Jehoiakim, and it came also in the time of... And, got it. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, oh, Lord, but I cannot speak, for I am a child. Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whomsoever, whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. I don't have a confidence problem. <laughs> you might. <laughs> we might. God has no confidence problem. It's a pretty good deal when you stop to consider that he knew you before you were born. So all your excuses were already noted, annotated, and accounted for. Come grump. You know... Second Chronicles 11.2 For the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying. Isaiah 38.4 Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying. Ezekiel 1.3 The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzzai, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Chebar, at the hand of, as, and, and, and yeah. the hand of the Lord was upon him. What do you mean the hand of the Lord was there upon him? Wait a minute. Hold the phone. Let's picture that phrase we just blew by. Do -de -do -de -do, having a nice walk by the river Chivar. Isn't this wonderful? God's creation is great. And boom! The hand of the Lord hits. I don't know. Was it the anointing? I don't know. It was the hand of the Lord. <laughs> was it thunk? Did he get slain by the Spirit? All it says is the hand of the Lord came. Do you know what happened when Saul walked among the prophets? Boom! Hit the ground. Word of the Lord came. <laughs> God knows how to arrest your attention. He knows how to stop you in your tracks. He knows how to say, whoosh, dimensional window open, time for communication, please receive. <laughs> yeah. And when completed with you, he knows how to do like he did to Robert's Lernet 8, 
turn the TV back on so you can go back about your life. That's what he says in his testimony. Came in, turned the TV sound off, left the visuals on, talked to him, and then on the way out, turned the volume back on. Well, God would never turn the TV on. That's what the man kid was doing. He just stepped in for a moment, just a visitation, just an intrusion, just a short interjection in your existence that's going to permanently change you for the next 50 years. Way cool. <laughs> yeah, way cool. That's what we want, right? We want him to come down and intervene, interject, intercept. Yeah. Just plain inter. <laughs> uh -huh. The word of the Lord came unto, I'm sorry, Hosea 1.1. 1, 1. The word of the Lord came unto Hosea, son of, in the days of, kings of, some of, some of, uh, I wonder how my spiritual journal should read I started for a little while trying to track when things showed up, just because way long back, way long back, uh -huh, way back when, I, uh, I got this point about, you know, pay attention to when it comes and how it comes. Because, you know, like it says, the, the uh, centurion came up, asked for healing for his kid, or servant, and uh, in that selfsame hour he was healed. They knew by the timing, asked at this moment, received at this moment. It's sometimes a good thing to know when God shows up, when he gave you the re revelation, what sequence he gave you the revelations he gave you. As I said to a person yesterday, if I'd have read my own mini-theses, I probably could have saved myself some real disasters in 1986. Because I'd already written the papers on how to avoid them. Of course, I didn't read them until afterwards. That was bright. It was only a paper, right? Just a revelatory treatise to be written for the purpose of a grade and finishing a THM degree, right? That's all God was really interested, right? Was me getting an A, right? When the Lord, word of the Lord comes in any form, one should be more uh, uh, circumspect. Word of the Lord came to... I'm sorry, Joel 1.1. 1, 1, I said that? No, I didn't. Word of the Lord came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Jonah 1.1. 1, 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. Jonah 3, 1. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, <clears throat> Why are you running? Anyway. Micah 1, 1. The word of the Lord came to Micah. Zephaniah 1, 1. The word of the Lord came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amari, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. <laughs> a lineage with a word of the Lord attached to it. <laughs> in other words, you want to know how much integrity this guy had? God made sure to quote his entire family tree as credible. That's the way I hear it. Haggai 1.1. One, one, one. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of, governor of, friend of, high priest. Yeah, that's credible testimony. Yeah, when we start speaking to dignitaries and all of a sudden our gifting leads us in front of kings and magistrates and we've been asked, please go tell the governor of and you go up and tell the governor of and it really happens the way the, the, the Lord told it, uh, you, can, you have the right to run around through the churches and give your testimony. That's right. Oh, he's just bragging. <laughs> no, he's trying to tell you, Lord, and get pretty specific around here. Zechariah 1.1, one. eighth month, second day of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, <coughs> the son of Bar Barakai, the son of Iddo, the prophet. Mm -hmm. Third generation prophet. Come on. Hello. Zechariah 1 7. Upon the fourth and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Sabbath, in the year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah. Luke 3 2. Let's bounce into the New Testament. Word of the Lord didn't stop in the Old. Duh. It stopped at the Apostolic Age. Duh, not. Luke 3 2. Ananias and Caiaphas, being the high priest. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. You had all these religious folk, and God decides not to go to their school and talk to them. He talks to some fella out here in the weeds. Yeah, what do you know? <laughs> When's forth come with the word of the Lord? I don't know, from places where people aren't getting their heads filled with a bunch of garbage? John 10.35, interesting verse. It says, If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, we'll get to the word scripture shortly, 
The Word of God came and the Scripture can't be broken. How do we know the Scriptures are the Word of God? Oh, shut up. You're not going to ask me that again now, are you? We call it the Scriptures. What we really are saying is the Word of God. What we're really saying is God talks. And there were some folks in history who listened. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Ready? For our gospel came not into you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. You know who we are. You know what we are. But this gospel we're bringing you, this is not a bunch of blabby words. We can back it up. Everybody in this room should be saying, Lord, back it up. I don't want to just tell somebody good ideas. I don't want to talk to you know, people on the street. and I don't want to talk to people in, at work. and I don't, want, I, I don't want to just talk. Do you? No, you want to deliver something. You want to, as it were, take your um, spiritual C4, hand it to them, put the charge in it, set the timer, and walk away. Let God deal with it. You want to give them the drink that's going to change them forever. Say, drink at your convenience. Call me when you're done. Fair enough. People have been, been saved by getting woken up in the morning with visions. People have gotten saved in dreams. Woke up and then dedicated. People have gotten saved by being slammed to the ground, spun around in a circle. Every one of these I've read or, or heard. Walk into the presence of a man of God. You weigh about 280 pounds. You're a bodybuilder and God decides to spin you like a top for a while. One testimony I read one time. Guy didn't believe in all that slain in the spirit stuff. So God didn't slay him. He spun him. Okay. Good point. Got it. Some people fall forward. Some people fall backwards. Some people fall sideways. Some people accidentally don't fall like Hagen did in one testimony where he walked backward across the stage and floated for a second and then walked back on the stage. Big to do in the non-charismatic circles. He levitates. Proof. Proof of what? <laughs> what was he preaching while he did that? I want to know that message. God says, this message is important. I don't want him to fall down. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Moving on. The Word of God is written history. We're talking about the Word of God here and what it is. It's history. Exodus 17, 14. The Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. We accept the five books of Moses as the Word of God. Why? Because God said to write it down. To put it another way, God said this is important. Please pay attention. You're going to go away. You're going to die one day, Moses. And I cannot have my word die with you. To put it another way, in corporate terminology, we need to cross-train. <laughs> we need to have you write the procedure so the next guy knows what to do. And then he needs to write it for the next guy, and he needs to write it for the next guy. And about 6,000 years later, some fella handed me a copy of this. Now it's my turn to read the manual, the procedure book, the policy book. You know what I'm saying? Now it's my turn to determine how to run this program because the word of God cannot be stopped it must not be stopped he says if you won't praise me rocks will praise me I don't think I want to come home someday to listen to my furniture praising God because I haven't been can he do that? <laughs> the law and the prophets it's a phrase that's used quite a bit the law and the prophets are the word of God Deuteronomy 17.8 and it shall be when he sits upon the throne of the kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests of the Levites. So the Levites were supposed to hang on to the word of God that had been already recorded and the king was supposed to come in and make his own copy. He was supposed to have his own copy made. Get in the picture here? You're supposed to have your own copy made. <laughs> it might not hurt a few saints to copy their Bible from cover to cover like an Old Testament saint did just once. I don't have time to read my Bible. Fine. You want to rule in God? We'll make you write it. That's what God did to his folks. 
early on. Well, how do you know it's the Word of God? Because they had to copy it. This sets the pattern for manuscripts translations into the future. Because they said, oh, oh, that means we got to give it to the next guy and give it to the next guy and make sure it goes to the next guy. And the guy who doesn't want to take the time to write it down, guess what happens to him? Oh, he slips, he slides, he falls, he doesn't know what he's doing, he bumbles, he fumbles in the dark. Next king comes along and goes, oh, I was supposed to make a copy of that. And he rules and he reigns and he prospers and he does well. And wow. How do we know? How do we know those manuscripts are true? Because they wrote it down because they didn't dare lose it. They didn't want to lose the word of the Lord. Numbers 5.23 and the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them with the bitter water. I mean, they even had rituals wrapped around writing the word. And little phylacteries, and all kinds of little things they did. To try to make sure it was nearby, to make sure that you didn't forget it, to make sure it was important. Little symbolisms. Walking symbolisms. Well, you don't need to wear it on your forehead, you need to wear it in your brain. Then it's in your forehead. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe sometimes you do need to wear it in front of your forehead to look at it and say, you know, I'm being a bit dull. You should have a Bible in every room in your house. We've tried to. Sometimes they get moved. They congregate. <laughs> then we bring them back out into other rooms of the house again. <laughs> Numbers 5.23. No, Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. This is a prophecy. He says, I gave it to you and I want you to go write it down, put it in a book, so for later. <clears throat> for later. The Lord comes to you and says, write it down for later. Guess what you're going to do? Right. Write it down for later. Jeremiah 30, verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, write thee, all the words that I've spoken unto thee in a book. In other words, don't leave out one word. Not one word. Oh, Do I got to write? <laughs> uh, are you blocking up the pipeline? Point taken. Uh, Jeremiah 36, verse 2. Take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I've spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day I spake unto you, from the days of Josiah, even to this day. The whole thing. Well, how do we know that these really are prophecies of God? Because some poor soul named Jeremiah, having a tough enough day as it was, doing a ministry that he was doing that was rather rough to begin with, now had to sit down and write it all down. Now, you don't think God didn't help him remember it? How do we know he wrote it down accurately? Because God inspired him to write it down accurately. He knew perfectly well the man wasn't going to write it by himself. Doesn't matter whether he had any manuenses sitting there while he was up to his neck in mud. The manuenses says, Okay, Jeremiah, what did the word of the Lord tell you last time? <laughs> we forget a lot of this was written with an amanuensis, a secretary. Time to take God memos. <laughs> I'm in stocks and bonds. Can you send me my amanuensis? Sure, but you're not getting out of jail. Okay. <laughs> How would you like to have that? The word of the Lord comes, and the secretary gets to leave with the peppery and take it to the church and minister. And you know, I was with the man of God, and the man of God clearly said, Oh, please come visit us, Brother Ben Sana. We want to hear what Jeremiah has to say. But Jeremiah can't come right now. I understand. He's kind of detained. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, we want the Word of God. We want to hear it. We've got to hear it. So, men and women of God, do you need time to write? Watch it. <laughs> Revelation 1.11 saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. Write it in a book. You see it, write it in a book. You hear it, write it in a book. Write it in a book. 
Aren't you glad to hear testimonies of other men and women of God that have gone before us in history? Doesn't it inspire you to hear some of their testimonies of deliverance and victory? And Doesn't that encourage you? And what about the saints who will be encouraged by yours? And mine? Write it in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. It hit me for the first time. This verse hit me just a week ago for the first time in 30 years of walking with God. I never heard this verse right. I had the picture in my mind, 10 second tangent, had the picture in my mind, yeah, um, that uh, what happened was he wrote these scrolls and he wrote one scroll for Thyatira and he wrote one scroll for Sardis and he wrote one scroll and gave it to Philadelphia and each one of them received their scrolls and the messenger of that church opened up the scroll and read out loud to the congregation their singular scroll from Revelation 2 and 3. That's how I always pictured it. Until a week ago, this verse dropped into my heart out of nowhere. I wasn't even reading it. It just dropped into my heart, and I saw it. What God said was, I want you to write all of this down, and I want you to ship it to all seven of them. You know what that did? That created an instantaneous verification of the Word of God. Because that meant Pergamus got to read Thyatira's message. Ooh. And that means Sardis got to know what Philadelphia was doing wrong. Ooh, I guess we don't get to hide our problems anymore. Right. And it's prophetic on top of that, because God is using it as types and shadows to say, now, having dealt with real issues, that solves forever the question of, were these messages to the real churches, or were these just messages about churches, or is this prophetic stuff, or is this... They sat there and went, ouch, 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 ouch. Now, the Ephesus church gets corrected for this, and Pergamus gets to hear it. So, if they were doing what they spiritually should be doing, this church would be praying about their heart problem, and this church is going to be praying about their Nicodelaidon's problem, and this church is going to be praying about their... And we all get the idea of what we're fighting for. And we get prophecy. Lots of the book of Revelation following it. I think it was delivered as a lump. Maybe a bundle of scrolls. But what God said was, get my word out to them. Matthew 5.17 Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Of course not. Why would he destroy the word of God? Matthew 7.12 Therefore all things whatsoever that you would that men should do to you, do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is what God wants from you. Here's how to behave. Here's how to act. Go read the book of Proverbs. You find all about how to deal with people. God's the very first one who wrote How to Cope with Difficult People books. Yep. Luke 24, 44, he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. How do we know they're messianic prophecies? Because he said they wrote concerning me. So we go looking into the Psalms, into the prophets, into the law, and say, Where be he? What did Christ see? And we say, oh, that's him. Oh, that's him. There's a type of him. There's a shadow of him. There's a piece of him. That's a part of what really happened. That's a true prophecy of him. You put it all together and you get him. Imagine being him, reading these songs that are being sung. Every- How would you like to walk into a room where somebody's singing a song, and, and it's a little diddly, right? And it's exactly the word of the Lord given to you five weeks earlier. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That the awareness of, oh, oh no, now that's not fair. That's about me. <laughs> Isn't that what prophecy is all about? Man walks into the room and hears things about himself and knows and is convinced. It's part of what prophecy does. John one forty five. Hang with me. I know this message is at a clipping pace. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Well, what do you know? Somebody with spiritual discernment to recognize the word of the Lord. They knew this Bible was the word of the Lord. You should walk away from this message with at least a strong assurance that we're following a book that is inspired, transmitted, transferred, handed down, delivered from God's mouth to my ear. 
Acts 13.15 After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, yada, yada, yada. Oh, don't ever open up to a preacher the opportunity. <laughs> Does anybody have a testimony? We read this scripture. Anybody know anything about the fulfillment of this verse yet? That's what they're saying. They read the law and the prophets. They read the prophets. They wanted to know when it was fulfilled. That's what we're doing too. We read the book of Revelation. Is it fulfilled by helicopters flying from the sky? No. Is it fulfilled by nuclear explosion? I don't think so. Is it fulfilled by... Well, what about the fig tree? Is the fig tree... Anybody know anything about the fig tree yet? Yep. Fig tree started. Yep, I saw it too. Yeah, me too. It's clear. Yeah, pretty clear. Uh-huh. Amen. No private interpretation here. There's enough people on the planet saying that Israel is blooming. That there ain't too many left on the planet saying Israel's not blooming. We don't know how it ties to everything yet. But them who were no people and were scattered across the earth have done the impossible and reconstituted back in their own land and started over. Now that's a trick. And proof that the word of the Lord came in a parable to a man, to disciples, to thousand years ago about should make you grin moving on Acts 24 14 this I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy so worship I the God of my fathers believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets call me what you want heretic what's it mean when they say call a heretic to call somebody heretics is to say they don't have the word of the Lord. To call somebody a heretic is to say that they ain't in God. you got to know if you're in God. You have to know if the word of the Lord came to you. Because you may have to endure toughness. You may have to wait patiently. You may have to follow after righteousness and not see the fulfillment instantly. We have some definite digging in the earth of our souls to do to make sure that the word of the Lord is always planted. Romans 13, uh, 3.21 But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being manifested by the law and the prophets. Matthew 5.18 For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. To wit, I add, or from the prophets, or from the Psalms, or from the Proverbs, or from Ecclesiastes, <laughs> or the book of Revelation. <clears throat> we have songs, poetic and prophetic, in the, in the Messianic Psalms, and then the Song of Solomon. Go read it. It's the word of the Lord. No, it's not. Song of Solomon is nothing more than a, a love romance novel. Wrong... I had people say to me, yeah, but look at the descriptions. Don't you think they're carnal? And I say, aren't you Hebrew? <laughs> Don't you understand symbolism? Pictures, what are you, a non-visual person? Visual people do not have problem with the Song of Solomon being spiritual. Verbal people sometimes do. Oh, that's, that's too risque. Oh, no, no, you've got to be at least 30 before you read that book. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> well... If you're looking at it through those eyes, maybe you should be 60 before you read it. It's full of wisdoms and proverbs. It's full of instructions and righteousness. It's full of God telling us how to live, what to live, where to live, when to live. And P.S., I'm going to step in and intervene and show you exactly how to live, what to live, where to live. You know what I mean? There's the classroom instruction book, and then there's the Personal application book. I'll tell you one thing about Mormons that's right. Ready? Tongue in cheek. I'll tell you one thing about Mormons that's right. They put their Bible here, and their people believe that their people are prophets, so they put their prophets right next door. Now think about that for a moment. From a God-honoring point of view, if what they had there was true, it would be right to do. 
because this is the word of God to you. I'll say, use a name, Rick Joyner. And this is a stack of visions, prophecies, and dreams he's had that he has to live by right next to the book. See, the problem is the church world has created a dichotomy. They don't like spiritual experiences. They don't like the fact that God still talks. They don't like the fact. So they say, it stopped back here. But God's now in the business of giving us the second scroll. And it's real. And it must never contradict the first scroll. And I'm just going to keep moving this book backward and forward until you get the picture nice and clear. At the end of your life, this should be the book of you. I know. I've read it. God's writing a book. That book is you. That book is me. That book is us. That book is a bunch of us's. Yeah. Collective us's. You know what I'm saying? What we're saying here is, the Baptists started here, and they actually did learn some things, and their book has stuff in it. The Presbyterians started here, they added some stuff, some things in it. The Pentecostals started here, they added some stuff and things in it. Oh, but it should never be given the same place and honor as the written word. Partly true, because these dudes came before us. And God is not the author of confusion, and he will not confuse himself. But that didn't mean you wouldn't have your own book next to your book. And it struck me this last week that I have to go back and make sure I, before I get any older and lose it all, write down everything else God said to me, whether about me or about others or whatever, if I can just find the time... Because I should have this book sitting on my table stand, and I should have this one sitting right next to it that reminds me everything the Lord told me. Because if I don't, I have despised the word of the Lord. Yeah. I want to be a prophet of God! I want to be a minister of God! I want to be a man of God! I want to be a woman of God! I want to be a... <clears throat> Do you have any idea what he said to you last week? Do you know what happened to Israel for forgetting what they were told? What I'm trying to say is, all of a sudden, the reality of it hit me. Get out of the theological abstract grid of Bible theology and bounce back to relationship. God had a talk with Adam. God had a talk with Cain. God had a talk with Balaam. God had a talk with Elijah. God had a talk with Jeremiah. God had a talk with... And he's never stopped talking. Mm -hmm. The word of the Lord is not to be forgotten. What was the opening verse in my message? And is this message going to go into two parts? Yeah, it's got to. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God is what we're to live by. Did Jesus Christ ever say every word that's written down on the scrolls and nothing after that? Only up until I speak. Then after that, no more. No more. I'm going to give you the comforter. He's going to show you things to come. He's going to give you the truth, and don't pay any attention to it, because only this counts. <laughs> right. hmm. Numbers 12, 6. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak to him in a dream. This is how I talk. At least God was nice. I mean... He didn't say, you know, okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to scare you silly with my voice. No, he comes and he says, no, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> here's how it works. Come to my meetings. This is what I do. I give visions. I give dreams. I give prophecies. I flow through you, in you, around you, by you, near you, your neighbor, next to you. Second Chronicles 32.2 Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, behold, they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, son of Amos. And in the books of the kings of Judah and Israel. The rest of the acts of Hezekiah are written in this prophet's books. So go read it. And God, what did God say to him? Write it in a book. So whatever God told him to write in a book, God wanted in a book. And this says, history got put in the book. So God wanted the history in the book because this is true history. From God's point of view. It tells about how he operates. It tells about what he does. It tells about who he is. So the word of the Lord can come to you, do this and live. 
Or it can say, take a look at what I did in the past and live. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Old Testament, New Testament, U Testament. Daniel 1.17 As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. If any man speak in tongues, let him speak with the understanding also. He sing in spirits, sing with the understanding also. See, that's because God, when he speaks, does sometimes put things in veils, parables, dark sayings, hidden mysteries, that he might conceal it from them who are wise and give it to them who are babes. That he might confuse the wise and give it to those who need it. Hmm? The truth of the matter is, visions and dreams are just a personal experience between him and them. Writing it down in a book makes it personal experiences between us and them and him. Hmm. I think we need more people who are going to understand visions and dreams. I think there's a lot of visions and dreams right now floating loose that uh, people honestly don't know how to interpret and they probably forgot to ask. Just because you get a vision doesn't mean you understood it instantly. I have seen people get visions and make up the interpretation. If you have symbolism in a vision, you better ask the Lord what that symbolism means. Sometimes the symbolism will be so close to Scripture that it's obvious what it means, but sometimes not. A lion in a vision can either be Christ or your adversary. Right. Having said that, all visions are now game for testing the Spirit, trying the Spirit, and asking for interpretation. Because the objective is to hear the word of the Lord. Not the word of my mind and what I thought. Not to hear how cool your vision was. But to hear the word of the Lord. Mm. So I can test it. So I can see if it's for me. So I can apply it. So I can live by it. Because I'm supposed to live by... Every word. Every word. <coughs> Only every word that's given to me. That's all I have to live by. I don't got to live by nobody else's every word. Nice try. We are the body of Christ, and members in particular. The term scripture and scriptures is used quite frequently. And I have them all here. <laughs> Maybe I will make it through. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That ends the matter. <laughs> it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. <laughs> Daniel 10.21 But I will show thee what is noted in the scripture of truth. The scripture of truth. Mark 12.10 By the way, that was an angel explaining something to Daniel, in case you wondered. Hi, angels show up. They're going to explain what God said. Mark 12.10 Have you not read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? Haven't you read it? Don't you know what it means? Haven't you thought about it? Mark 15.28 The scripture was fulfilled, which saith he was numbered with the transgressors. Luke 4.21 He began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I know. I know the Lord showing me. It's done now. Can you imagine being that close to the Lord that you walk into a room, stand in front of all those people, open up a Bible, and say, Ladies and gentlemen, this day will come, I'm telling you. Ladies and gentlemen, the parable of the ten virgins is now in effect. Can you imagine the pit in your stomach that's going to hit if you didn't know it was coming? Yeah. You get my point? There's going to come a day. People say, well, how do we know that these prophecies are really what they say they are? Maybe they're symbolic, maybe they're literal, maybe they're whatever. I'll tell you when you'll know. When they happen, guaranteed you'll know. Yeah. Right. Up till now and then, you better get into the Spirit and find out what the Spirit is saying to verify that it's coming, because you don't want to be caught by surprise. You don't want it to show up like a thief in a night on you, because you're children of the light. It's supposed to show up as a thief on them. Let me ask you a question. How many prophets forewarned us about airplanes plowing into New York? 
I never heard any. It happened as a surprise attack. That's a thief in the night attack. There are things coming in prophecy that we are supposed to, as a body corporate, start getting the resonating sound on our tuning forks that says, whoa, whoa, that's coming, that's coming, I can feel it, it's coming, I know it, it's coming. Vision should start happening to confirm the word while the world goes, oh, life continues on as it was from the beginning of our fathers. And we're going, oh no, world government's coming. Oh no, uh, no, you can't do that. If you do that, we're going to end up with the mark of the beast. Uh, oh no, if you do that, we're going to end up, oh, that's the road to hell for sure. Oh dear, dear, dear me, that's too close to the scriptures. Now you get a little too close to that verse right there. You know what I'm saying? It puts a pit in your stomach all of a sudden. Doesn't, doesn't it put a pit in your stomach when you read the news and it seems like things are kind of coming near statements that have been written 2,000 years ago? You know what I'm saying? It'd be one thing if some insider snuck out from the inner circle of the special secret organizations which don't exist and have never been found and said, this is going to happen in five years. You know what I mean? We'd say, oh, wow, we got a board. We, we should probably pay attention to this guy because he's like current, you know? What about the guy that 2,000 years ago wrote it? <laughs> I, John, on the island of Patmos, saw these things in a vision. Here's what's going to happen. <laughs> now it's different. Something that's been lying dormant for 2,000 years starting to come to pass? Guess what the saints will say? It's the word of the Lord! Guess what the world's going to say? I don't want him! John 2.22 Therefore, when he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture, and the word which Jesus had said. Jesus told them what he was going to have happen. The scriptures told them what was going to have happen, and the two confirmed each other. But not until after it happened. I do wish we'd get the point before it happens a little bit more. But at least we got the point after it happens really hard. John 7:38. He that believeth on me, as the Scriptures has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Where does it say that, Lord? Go find it. <laughs> John 7:42. Hath not the Scriptures said that Christ comes of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Details, details. John 10:35. If he called them gods into whom the world, the word of God came, and the Scripture cannot be broken. Can be broken. It's an endless chain cannot be twisted and turned without consequence. It can't be stopped, in other words. John 13, 18. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture might be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me has lifted his heel against me. My gift of discernment is predicated on scripture and seeing you, Judas. Ouch. When we start knowing the word and then getting verifying visions, dreams, and so forth to support it, and it happens, it's, it's solid. There's no way out. You can't come back five years later and say, Lord didn't show me that. He will make sure that your current understanding, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning the spirits and all that, is concurrent with his word. So that when it happens, you've got the mouth of two witnesses, not one. Ten witnesses, not two. A host watching over. Not you by yourself. There are many voices in the world, but there's only one voice we need to hear. The every word voice. <laughs> John 19, 28. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be filled, fulfilled, saith, I thirst. I mean, I'm just up on the cross. And he goes, well, that concludes that verse. Next, I thirst. <laughs> How'd you like to be that precise in the middle of your prophetic future? John nineteen twenty eight. No, John nineteen thirty six. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Nineteen thirty seven. And again, another scripture saith, "They shall look on him whom they pierced." Go find it. You'll find it interesting where that one shows up in the Old Testament. John 20, verse 9, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So there's word of the Lord out there saying he was going to rise from the dead. 1,500 years earlier. 
we, we know God fulfills things 15, 1,800 years later. Because Messiah was fulfilled 15, 1,800 years later. So why should it surprise us if now John on Patmos says something that's not going to get fulfilled for 15 or 1,800 years later? Sounds like the MO of God to me. Leave enough time so that everybody gets all confused, wondering if it's ever going to happen, and then do it. That's going to catch your adversary off guard. Acts 1.16, moving right on into the New Testament age. Men and, women, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, yada, yada, yada. Where did David in the mouth of David ever say anything about Judas? Go find it. It's got to be in a song somewhere. Acts 8.32, the place of scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb dumb before his shears, so opening out his mouth. Here, guys, I'm just preaching my message. Let me show you where the reference is. Here, I'm just, okay, now this point I'll support by this verse. This point I'm going to support by this verse. This point I'm going to support by this verse. Want to know why I believe what I believe? Here's what I believe. Acts 8.35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Just started right up where the guy was reading. And from there, preached Jesus. Romans 4.3, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. That's what it says. Romans 9.17, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Really? That's a New Testament Romans passage quoting an Old Testament story. Well, how do we know that's valid? <laughs> and then years plus later, they're still quoting it as valid. Romans 10.11 For the scriptures saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Romans 11.2 God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew, what ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying? So you're supposed to learn from these examples, learn from these things that are preached. Galatians 3 8, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. The gospel unto Abraham. Not that the gospel didn't come till Christ. Think again. In thee shall all the nations be blessed. There's your fulfillment. Who's blessing all the nations? The saints. And one day Israel, when they rule the world, will bless all the nations. Galatians 3.22 But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Galatians 4.30 Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? That's a good question to ask all the time. We should be running around doing that a lot. What does the scripture say about that? But I might add one more thing to it. What does your personal scripture say? Check it too. That's your rudder. The other is your steering wheel. You know what I'm saying? Steer. But your personal revelations are going to guide you. It's going to be part of your guidance. This is Logos and rhema to them, but logos to us, and yours is going to be rhema to you, and logos to somebody else. Mm -hmm. We're passing on the baton. 1 Timothy 5.18, the scripture says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. The laborer is worthy of his reward. Speaking about ministers. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration. Read it already. James 2.8 If you fulfill the royal law, royal law, according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Fulfill the royal law of scripture. James 2.23 The scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. It was fulfilled what the scripture says. We're going to see a whole lot more scriptures fulfilled before this is over. Promises to Abraham, promises to Isaac, promises to Jesus, promises to Paul, promises to us. When God gets done wrapping up the plan, 
I guarantee you the ledger of prophecy will have fulfilled on the bottom line. James 4, 5. Do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit dwelleth in us lust to envy? Yeah. It's not in vain. 1 Peter 2, 6. Wherefore also is it contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. He that believes on him shall not be confounded. I'm going to stop right there. Surprise, surprise. Except I need a bar pen. Thank you. So I can mark that last verse. Thank you. Here's the thing, see? Here's the thing, see? Here's the thing, see? We'll finish this message next week. Because you need to know these verses and just hear them. And I'm sure the Lord will probably put just a little bit more in it at the end there, but... When we stop and consider that we're walking this walk, as it were, in a blind, we have no choice but to follow what the Word of the Lord gives us. Because we can't see time streams. We can't see eternities. We can't see beyond the end of our breakfast time. But He can. So He has taken it upon Himself to always make sure that He's going to tell us what we've got to do. If we're willing to listen to what He has to say. What I wanted you to get primarily, well, maybe not primarily, but it's certainly a main point, is look at how many people are just bebopping through their life, and here comes the word of the Lord. And it changes history every single time. And then we pass it on so everybody remembers what God did. We will keep track of our genealogies. We will keep track of what great dad said. We'll write books called Everything I Learned, I Learned from My Father. You know what I'm saying? To pass on that tribal knowledge, that past generation understanding, that essential stuff that shouldn't be forgotten. God was no different. He said, I will make sure that my family knows everything that I do. I will make sure that my prophets tell everybody what I did. I'll make sure that you do too, if you'll let me. We must seek the word of the Lord. My sheep know my voice. That is a crucial cornerstone verse. But there should be no surprise about it coming. There should be no surprise about him doing it. There should be no surprise that it happens. There just should be a hunger for, Lord, give me more. Some people say, well, you shouldn't really press after those things because you might get a demon. You might get deceived. If a man asks of his yeah. father bread, dad's going to hand him a rock. Change your faith. If God has been straight with all these men and women of God through history, no reason to presuppose he ain't going to be straight with you. You be honest with him, he'll be honest with you. Scripture is of no private interpretation, was the next verse, and it is not. Personal prophecy does have a certain element of private interpretation to it. But the truth of the matter is, you put it all together, it's the word of the Lord to the entire body of Christ over periods of time. It's one big, resonating God talking. And that should give us a lot of hope. It should give us a lot of peace. And it should give us a lot of examples to think about for the rest of our life. So for the moment, I'm going to conclude. Jesus, we thank you for your word, which is written for an admonition to us. We yield now, Lord, to the songs... And the other things, Lord, that you would bring us. We love you. Thank you.